So we're going to now uh, have our first keynote um, speaker. Uh, I am very um, glad to present to you uh, Professor Karen Chapel. She is director of the School of Cities in the University of Toronto. She also serves there as professor in the Department of Geography and Planning. Uh, she is Professor Emerita of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley, where she served as department chair. Um, she was also my teacher there. Um, Dr. Chapel studies inequalities in the planning, development, and governance, re governance regions of, in the Americas with a focus on economic development and housing. In 2023, Karen Chapel received the Sir Peter Hall Award for Lifetime Contribution in the Field from the Regional Studies Association. Um, and she's just an amazing speaker and an amazing person. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for being here with us. Thank you so much, uh, Manuel. Um, he's uh, being uh, modest when he says he, uh, I was his teacher. Actually, so when Manuel came to Berkeley, um, he was the most brilliant student we had ever had, and he became completely beloved, not just of the, of the students, but the faculty. So we actually had fights among the faculty about who got to have him in, in their class, who got to work with him. So Unam is very, very lucky. To have Manuel. So, uh, gracias por la invitación. Uh, me encanta la ciudad linda de México. So, I'm very happy to, to visit anytime. Um, and I, I want to um, talk today um, about, about resilience, which is the topic of this conference, but with a focus on climate and climate change. Um, and also displacement, uh, because about 10 years ago, I founded something called the Urban Displacement Project, and we have begun to think very seriously about climate displacement. So this is a map uh, from last week from NASA of uh, fires around the world. It's actually fires and thermal anomalies, um, and you can see those dots look awfully <laughs> Big. If you zoomed in, uh, they would be smaller. But what, what is interesting about this is uh, that uh, every continent is suffering from thermal anomalies of one kind or another. Um, and uh, it, in some ways, fire has uh, has has uh, taken over as the climate change uh, crisis of our time. Well, we could talk about floods as well, right? Um, but fire, um, nature is having its way uh, with fire, and, and now we're seeing uncontrolled burns in a way we didn't anticipate, in a way our models never um, um, accounted for. So uh, it's something that uh, we're really going to have to work uh, on as, as planners and geographers in the future. This is an image from three days ago in Yellowknife, uh, Canada, in the Northwest Territories. This is the evacuation. This was an evacuation of a city of 22,000 people. Um, and it's not the first time, of course, that Yellowknife and the Northwest Territories have been evacuated. Um, that region uh, in Northwest Canada, um, the Northwest Territories and Alberta have been hit by fires repeatedly. It's just that the one right now is the largest ever in history. So I uh, happened just last week to go to Fort McMurray, which was hit by fires in 2016. Fort McMurray is about a day drive south of Yellowknife. And I met there with a group of stakeholders. And I just wanted to share with you a quote from a woman named Kelly, because it struck me so powerfully during our meeting. And, and I think we should hear all of her words. So she said, because I think that mentally that has affected a lot of our community 
And we lost a lot of good people that didn't return because they weren't able to return after the fire. And then we got hit by a flood and we lost more people. So, you know, I, I really hate the R word. I understand it's a positive word, but I'm really tired of using the word resilient as an indigenous person. I'm tired of being resilient. I want there to be processes in place that we don't have to be so resilient that it's become the norm for us. I truly believe no one should be without a roof. Now, that doesn't mean just build homes because there's so much more that has to be in place for those people. So that's, I think, a huge breakdown that we have up here. We talk about it at the table from our groups or organizations. Burnout is a big piece. How do we make sure that our people are not burning out? No pun intended. So this is Fort McMurray. Uh, so here, this is just uh, on our tour, we looked at some of the housing. This row of housing was completely burned in 2016 and then completely rebuilt in place. And uh, this is true of every neighborhood in Fort McMurray. The insurance money uh, uh, allowed for rebuilding in place. Everybody did. They did one thing different this time. They put all that green grass there, that's a fire break. Um, so hopefully next time uh, there'll be a little bit of time before you have to leave um, or maybe the fire uh, won't reach the houses. So as academics, we're of course thinking about this a lot. Um, and here we have a great gathering of academics and technical experts. Um, it, academics, some uh, are becoming public uh, scholars on this issue, and I point you here to an article by Professor Danielle Aldana Cohen, who's a professor at Berkeley in sociology, and he wrote this article on in The Nation uh, last fall, um, and it said, should we start preparing for the evacuation of Miami? He said the unspeakable. Guys, number one, we're going to have to evacuate. And then he said, number two, that's going to force other places to get serious about hosting climate migrants. So in other words, we're going to have to work on the sending cities and we're going to have to work on the receiving cities. And, uh, you know, I think we all agree as academics, we have to do something. We have to plan for this. We have to plan our cities for this. For I don't think there's any disagreement um, in academia. Well, Fox News picked up Daniel's uh, story um, and actually quoted almost directly. I, you know, sometimes they're very lazy and they just kind of cut and paste from other sources. And so, so they quoted, you know, Miami should begin preparing for evacuation due to climate change, Berkeley professor argues. Um, and um, it, I thought this was fantastic. In fact, Danielle tweeted it out. He was very excited to be quoted in Fox News and thought, well, here we can start to counter misinformation and uh, really have an impact on the mass media. Well, the next uh, day or week, um, um, the, Fox had another story. Um, Miami mayor hits back at climate ideologues who spelled doom for the city. I'm fired up about this. So so this is this Miami mayor, uh, Suarez, uh, no relation, um, and he is um, uh, running for president right now. But, um, but, but so he pushed back and Fox loved it, right? Um, and this became the story and this became the line. Um, and whatever intern wrote the story before has probably been fired. Um, and now this is the line, uh, Daniel, uh, Professor Cohen is a climate ideologue, um, and spelling doom is, 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 is silly. And you see the little subtitle under there. Uh, Suarez urged naysayers to believe the private sector. Believe the private sector because it's going to solve the problem. So that leads me to my questions uh, for today that I, I want to talk about with you all. Uh, the first is basically how do we plan for more resilient cities in the face of climate change? So how do we plan our sending cities, whether we're planning for evacuation um, or adaptation, which will be possible in some of the sending areas? Um, and in receiving cities, how are we going to welcome climate refugees? Um, and so these are the types of cities that we're working on in my field, uh, urban planning, 
um, and um, great questions, lots of work to do. But there's another question, which is about the people who are tired. So how do we support Kelly and the millions of others who are just tired of being resilient? That's the second issue. And number three, how do we counter the misinformation um, that we are up against, that's undermining our expertise and even undermining, I'd argue, our compassion? Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about theory. Um, so theorizing resilience. There's a great article, 2009 article by uh, Rolf Pendel, um, Catherine Foster, and Kate Cowell. Um, and uh, they, they did this as part of, we had a big project for the MacArthur Foundation, um, and it, it was uh, called Building Resilient Regions. We basically, it was a junket. Um, we spent two years eating and talking about resilience. And then some great articles came out of it, uh, too. So kudos to the MacArthur Foundation. So they had they put together a framework um, which has been cited very, very widely. And they reviewed literature on resilience in psychology, in engineering, in economics, in urban studies, in uh, regional science, etc. And, uh, and came up with this framework. Um, so the first thing you can think about is the nature of the challenge. Is, is it an acute shock? You know, is it an earthquake, right? Um, or a, a rapid change in, in technology? Or is it a chronic slow burn, a gradual, say, subsidence of a city um, into a, an ancient lake bed? Um, and it, then you can look at resilience in different ways. So there's, there's the single equilibrium resilience, which is the, basically the return to normal. Um, so, you know, say you have an auto plant. It's a, a, a Toyota plant. Um, it's go, it's, there's a recession. It suffers. Um, and, and then um, you, you bring it back. You're resilient. You bring back that Toyota plant. Maybe you subsidize it. You keep it going. You give it new equipment. And uh, that Toyota plant is resilient, and then that auto sector is resilient. Multiple equilibria would mean um, it, maybe you maybe you establish the, the car plant, but maybe you also add a, a electric car vehicle plant. Um, maybe you try and experiment with active mobility. So, uh, so you establish basically a new normal, um, and and you improve that performance of, of your um, original. Um, assets like the, the Toyota plant. Um, and then the, they argue that actually we need to go one step further into complex adaptive systems um, where we continually adapt our systems so that instead of subsidizing the Toyota plant or subsidizing the new electric car manufacturer, you want to subsidize entrepreneurs generally and see, see if you can uh, innovate continually um, to, to keep your economy resilient. So uh, when I looked at this and thought about climate change, I realized, by the way, that, that you couldn't kind of put in different categories the acute shock and the chronic slow burn, because what's happening with climate change is that those are combined. Those are, happen both at once. We're having the acute shock of fires uh, with a gradual uh, change of, of the climate. Um, and this, this puts even more pressure on, on how, uh, how we do our resilience. So in this example, going back to Fort McMurray, the, the, what, what's been done so far in terms of urban resilience in Fort McMurray is basically going to a new normal. So yes, they rebuilt in place, but they added the fire break. Um, so they'll do a little bit better. They have improved uh, performance uh, for next time. So with that prologue, I want to talk a little bit about urban displacement and, and some of put some definitions in place and some background. So um, we started working on displacement, I guess it was um, 15 years ago, my lab, 
Um, but um, we realized quickly that actually a lot of people before us had been working on displacement and doing wonderful work, uh, like Peter Marcuse. Um, but this is, this is a chart defining dipla displacement that the Housing and Urban Development Department put together in the 1970s um, with a, trying to broaden our understanding of displacement so that we see it not just as something that um, is about urban renewal, um, but is about gentrification, is about uh, landlords not keeping the property up, is about other public improvements, is about code enforcement, which ends up in people getting evicted, uh, and so forth. So there's, there's many different forms of displacement. Now, the context for um, that agency working on displacement was urban renewal. Um, and uh, there's been some recent work now at the University of Richmond on, on the families that are, have been displaced by, uh, were displaced by urban renewal in the United States. So they're estimating 300,000, so that's a million people. Um, but you all know from working in cities around the world that it's millions and millions and millions and millions of people across, uh, you know, uh, uh, different Asian cities and European cities and, um, and African cities and Latin American cities everywhere, right? We have seen urban renewal and displacement related to that. So what are the legacies of that whole uh, movement um, is that neighborhoods were traumatized, communities were traumatized, and people don't trust planners. People don't trust the public sector. This is, I, I just use this image, I love this image. This is on top of what was going to be the Lincoln Center. Um, it's uh, Robert Moses and uh, sitting there with John D. Rockefeller and they hired some ballerinas to come up and celebrate uh, the new cultural um, intervention, Lincoln Center, um, which displaced um, 7,000 families. Um, and uh, so, um, but this is something, again, that we've seen across the entire globe, um, is that trauma, what, what um, Mindy Fullalov calls root shock, that shock of, of losing your home. Now, more recently, we become concerned with green gentrification, so, uh, and now we're talking about climate gentrification. So um, this is the idea, uh, first of all, that you would have gentrifying neighborhoods, and then you'd come in and try and improve them. And this, is, this book is about Brooklyn um, and all the waterfront parks and, and um, wonderful amenities uh, that popped up in, in Brooklyn in the last 30 years. So you have, this is essentially climate change mitigation, right? We're planting trees. We're putting active mobility interventions, bike lanes. We're putting uh, new transit lines. Um, and with the idea of getting people out of their cars, and, and uh, this is a worthwhile endeavor, um, but folks have point, pointed out that there could be unintended consequences. So I call this triple jeopardy because we have the gentrifying neighborhoods. And then we have the climate change mitigation, which is furthering gentrification and potentially displacement as well. And then uh, we have climate refugees on top of that. So let's talk a little bit more about this phenomenon globally of climate displacement that we've seen. Um, the World Bank has been putting out a series of reports, groundswell reports, that estimate uh, the number of displaced. I, I get the feeling that um, these need to be updated because the numbers I'm seeing now are, are much higher. Um, but they, they say in this, this is the 2021 report that said by 2050, we have 216 million people displaced. I like uh, to follow the work of the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center um, in Switzerland, I think. Um, and they have been looking at climate displacement and political displacement. So in orange are the political displacements, in blue are the disaster displacements. Um, and uh, you can see that this uh, disaster displacement is beginning uh, to dwarf the political displacement. And often they're interconnected, and that's a whole uh, literature. But these, uh, this, is, this is what they're calculating is 61 million uh, in 2023 uh, uh, or 2022, excuse me, displaced. Um, and the majority of those uh, displaced by, by disaster. And you can, you can see the way it's trending. Uh, that, that was a big bump up in 2022. And I dread to think what 2023 looks like. 
Now, there's a whole literature on this, which I won't go into today, but it's one of the interesting things is globally how it's going to exacerbate global economic disparities as we have impacts on the productivity, the labor productivity and uh, infrastructure and so forth. So you have the losers and here it looks uh, to be the Southern Hemisphere and, and the winners. And uh, here they have uh, Canada and Europe uh, as the as the winners. I'm not sure um, now that we understand fire better that this map would still hold. This is from, I think, a 2018 paper by my uh, Berkeley colleague Solomon Sang. Um, so then the question becomes, um, this is a New York Times piece asking, um, where will people go? So that becomes the question uh, for us. It's, it's clear to me that the displaced are going to go to cities. Um, and uh, in, in large, uh, they're likely to go to the cities. This is actually a guardian map of whether you need air conditioning or not. And in, the, in light blue are the places that just need heat. And then purple are the ones that need heat and air conditioning. And then orange is air conditioning. So anyway, a lot of it is going to depend on energy systems and how we're modifying our climate. Um, it will depend on where people end up. And then I think there's also a really interesting metropolitan uh, structure question. Oh, are they going to land in peripheries? Or are they going to um, try to go to the heart of cities. On the bottom here is Toronto. The top here is the field trip on Saturday. If you want to join, this is the, the cable bus in Teotonga. Um, if you uh, want to go see this uh, autonomous settlement on Saturday. So um, we started working on this. We, we did a massive lit review. We actually thought this was like a two month project and it took two years um, and was something like 700 sources. Um, but we, we started in my lab to review the literature on climate change and displacement um, and um, so, you know, started to, to think about, you know, here are the kind of classic displacement pressures that we have, that first piece of the triple jeopardy, neighborhood change, uh, housing prices, uh, property values, et cetera. Um, and then you add to that the second uh, leg, of the climate mitigation, which is coming in and then uh, I I augmenting the displacement pressures um, um, so and complicating uh, things. Um, in, in the lit review and other work, um, we've been exploring um, what's really different about climate displacement from uh, urban displacement as we had theorized it over the last decades. There's an interesting set of literature on each of these, and I'm, I'm not going to go in detail, but um, this, this solastalgia is a, is a, in psychology theories about how people lose their, uh, have place attachment, um, and so they're particularly traumatized um, as they're not, they're not just pushed out of their place, but their place is destroyed. Um, policies play a, a really unique role with climate displacement. There's a south-north dynamic, as we saw before in, in, the, in the maps. Um, mental health uh, impacts seem to be uh, more extreme with climate displacement. Um, there's, uh, of course, cultural tensions between who gets to leave and who gets to enter uh, global cities. Um, there's even issues of species migration, which is altering our ecosystems. Um, there's a whole um, literature in, 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 the, in, in literature studies um, about dis, with dystopian imaginaries um, that has sort of taken this idea of displacement and, and layered on the climate crises. Um, and um, it, uh, the, many people are studying it through that lens. Um, and then, of course, this triple jeopardy issue, which I raised. Um, technical experts are, by and large, not thinking about all these dimensions of the problem. Um, and um, so here, you know, as we were looking around to see what cities were doing, of course, we hit a lot of work by McKinsey um, and, um, and similar types of um, consultancies. And you'll see that there's a lot of sophisticated thinking about risk assessments, about hazards, about what we do with wildfires versus heat versus flooding. Um, it, there's very little attention uh, to the people, to the, the people that are having to be resilient in, in this whole picture. So there's, uh, there's 
a number of challenges um, that we need to look at in how we um, accommodate climate migration or deal with climate migration, migration and, uh, without having this kind of triple jeopardy um, formation. Um, so one way of thinking about this, I think, is, is, was very well put um, in work um, by Hook and Miraftab. Uh, this is at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and uh, who wrote a wonderful uh, article called We Are All Refugees. Um, and so they're dealing with this issue again of what I showed earlier, the Professor Cohen um, and uh, saying we should evacuate Miami um, and this idea of expertise and planning um, versus versus what, um, what people on the ground actually need. So what they point out is that, you know, the state is, is seeing itself as a guardian of citizens um, and planning professional, professionals are trying to see themselves as, as mediating the relationship between citizens and the state. So they talk about this grandiose uh, role for the planner as the uh, public good defender. Um, and then, of course, inevitably, that public good defender ends up um, uh, simply enabling the more powerful private sector uh, to have its way. Um, so they, they argue, of course, that we need more of an insurgent uh, planning, planning um, and uh, uh, ways of decentering the state. Um, so that's one, one set of challenges. How do we decenter the state? Since we do know a lot, us experts uh, do know a lot about what we should do. Um, and then the second challenge is to think about countering uh, misinformation. So how do we, how do we actually um, overcome what, what Fox News and others are, are putting out? So let me talk a little bit about the research we've done. And here now we're going to go uh, geek out on data a little bit. Um, and uh, see what, what, what we can actually do. Do you know what happened? Check the connection. There, it's back. Oh, it's just on. I'll be gentle. Okay, so um, I'm going to take you on a bit of a mapping uh, journey, um, being the technocrat that I am. Um, so we we started in 2009 um, mapping gentrification and doing doing maps like this of, of neighborhood change uh, typologies, um, and that um, quickly. Um, grew into a, a set of, oh, sorry, set of, um, geez, going the wrong way, um, work um, on uh, uh, on the use of maps, and uh, and and we worked with uh, groups across the country um, to to uh, develop maps that could be used um, to identify neighborhood change, um, and then move policy in the end, um, and. Uh, so what we mapped basically was here are the areas that are gentrifying, here are the areas that are at risk of gentrifying in the future. So the kind of an early warning system for, for gentrification and displacement. Um, and here are the exclusive areas um, where, which are actually also displacing low income folks gradually. So we, we worked with these maps and we put out a series of them. And then as we looked at ours and we looked at other people's uh, maps, uh, we realized uh, that we had a, a kind of an issue with the ecological fallacy, uh, which you will all be familiar with being geographers. It was that this, the census tract ge geography that we were using was kind of masking individual experiences and diversity uh, within, the, within the area. Um, so, so often these maps could be kind of misleading. Um, and uh, maybe they're helpful in, in uh, kind of organizing communities. That's what this article is about, talking about how these maps could be used for empowerment. Uh, but they were not very accurate um, and, um, and, 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 in fact, could be quite 
deceptive given a census tract is is uh, 4,000 people um, and uh, with 30 blocks and so you could have two gentrifying blocks and uh, f and uh, 28 stable blocks um, and so it, very hard again to tell what's what's actually happening on the ground so we began to shift um, to individual level data and this has been the story of like the last six five or six years of my uh, research has been moving away from track level data and trying to trying to uh, identify different sources of individual level data that you can join with other data sources to tell to tell uh, stories that maybe are uh, a little bit more reflective of what's happening on the ground. This is our Twitter uh, work. Um, this is just an example of, uh, this is tweets. This is 1% of all tweets uh, in, in San Francisco. If you do 100% of all tweets, you blow up your computer. Um, so that this is 1% in a, in a period of time in the, in the 2000s. And um, we use this to identify people that were tweeting from home versus the ones were tweeting outside their home because we could kind of figure out where people lived based on, uh, on an algorithm. Um, and uh, so you could sort of see in blue were the, the people that were uh, outsiders in, in orange are the people that are, are at home. Here's the outsiders. Um, and you can see uh, the, this gets validated because they're actually going along the streets and corridors so you can sort of see how these are these are outsiders um, and this this data actually becomes very useful differentiating differentiating outsiders from insiders when you're trying to predict a gentrification so this was our urban analytics and city science piece um, looking at how to predict gentrification displacement with this kind of uh, data so we, at the same time, we also began kind of refining our work on transit. Um, and so this was the book that I did with Anastasia Luketu Sedaris um, in uh, 2019, looking at uh, investment around 700 new transit stations planned for California and the displacement that was happening around those. Um, the book is free. Um, the answer was, it's complicated, it depends. Um, and so they had to give the, way, the book away for, for free because it was so, uh, such a balanced take on it. Um, but we, so we, we, we started digging in in a big way into what was going on in California. Great case study because there's a huge portfolio of climate investments. Um, including a cap and trade law, including in, immense transit investment, and including housing bonds, park bonds, uh, and more. Um, and so we did this. We did this analytic work. Now this time we're using individual level data on household mobility, so we could track where people were coming from and where they moved. Um, everybody in the U.S. is in this data set. It's very scary, um, and. Um, and it's a 20-year data set, so we could track over time. Um, and in this work, what we did is we took um, transit-adjacent communities and we took um, control neighborhoods and compared what, what were the displacement rates across them. Um, and there was kind of an interesting story that we didn't expect, and that's why I throw this chart up. See how close those two lines are? The control neighborhoods are very close uh, to the areas with transit investment. Um, so, uh, despite the kind of feeling on the ground that these investments are um, are going to displace everybody, um, they they may not be. Um, on the other hand, um, given the long time frames with transit investment, it could be that they were displaced decades before, um, and so that's why they're not being tracked here. Um, so then we moved to work on fire. And so using the same kind of individual level database, we've been tracking where people go after fires. So this is the, the Paradise, California tragedy where the entire uh, mountain community was wiped out. And this is where people went um, in the subsequent, by the subsequent year where they ended up. And uh, what's interesting here is that 90% of the people stay in the same within 50 miles of, uh, you know, 80 kilometers of this res res uh, the place that would burnt down. Um, so there's a huge, there's like a force of a gravitational pull, right? Well, it's place attachment. People want to go back. Um, and uh, so, uh, and if they don't go back, then they're still staying fairly near in the same kind of geographies here up and down the West Coast. 
Um, our latest foray into individual level data, and I'm getting a little bit away from the topic of residential displacement, but thinking about business displacement during downtown. Um, so we began looking at displacement of people and businesses during the pandemic uh, in this article, Pandemic Polycentricity. Uh, in CJ Res, and then um, and have a, we have another a couple articles under review here on, on this. But what we're doing here is we're using cell phone data, and we're looking uh, over time to see how that activity changes. So that's everybody's cell phone. It's workers, it's shoppers, it's visitors, it's residents. And we can look here. This is Toronto. Red is downtown Toronto. Here's the beginning of the pandemic, and here's the recover, recovery period. So. It never quite, this is pre-pandemic, pandemic, post-pandemic, post never quite gets back. Um, so this has been a really interesting analysis that we've extended across uh, North America. And finally, one last example of playing with data. Um, um, we, we did a study for Facebook um, where uh, Facebook was really intent on understanding how it was displacing people around it uh, in the community. Um, so, um, so we did a study which took every kind of data we could find on the area. So, in the in the hexaplexes here, you have um, you have uh, um, you're having oh building you're having a uh, let's see which one that is that's the building permits. The dots are code violations. Um, we did observation in the neighborhood with high school students. Uh, we did interviews. We look at the housing price increases by block. Um, this is from an interview from somebody right here. Um, and then we started layering onto this the Twitter data. So here's a tweet from the Facebook campus. Here's a tweet from the neighborhood. Here's another tweet from the neighborhood. Um, here's another tweet from the campus, the Facebook campus, the happiest place on earth. Um, and then here's sort of the angry uh, neighbors. Um, and then here's you can sort of start to see the infiltration of the tech workers into the local neighborhood by, by tracking their tweets. Um, in the end, I didn't get permission from our research ethics board. <laughs> <laughs> to, to do this, to continue this research, so uh, so this is a secret. Um, but we were continuing this kind of experimentation at the school cities. We just ran our first summer workshop on urban mixed methods uh, for PhD students. We had 25 uh, students from around the world. Uh, we paid their way, uh, and they came, and uh, we, we worked on mixed methods together um, this summer. And we, we'll be doing it next summer and every summer uh, going forward. Uh, this is something I'm really passionate about. So let me go back to resilience uh, to, to kind of wrap up here about what, what we can do. Um, so, so again, we're, we're thinking here about the last box. Um, and as academics and technical experts, I believe there's a lot we can do to support the continual adaptation of uh, communities so that they are resilient. And in the process, I believe uh, we can counter uh, the misinformation that's out there. Now, um, our traditional point uh, uh, approach as academics, uh, if we're doing applied work, um, we do kind of a review of housing policies. We do a bunch of recommendations at the end. This is one that we did in journal planning literature. It's a lit review on, on how, to, how to prevent displacement. Um, I, I don't believe this gets us very far, um, actually, in this entire uh, debate. Um, and I think we're probably much closer, we were much closer with our work on mapping and our work on getting it up online. At the Urban Displacement Project, we have 15,000 unique visitors every month. Um, and so it's folks like this man who downloaded the maps and went and said to his uh, city council in San Jose, California, um, hey, my neighborhood is gentrifying. You guys have to do something about it. Um, in the end, uh, these maps are one way. They're not terribly accurate. I'll be the first to admit that. But they're one way that we can really empower uh, people to understand uh, what's going on and to take action. And so we've put out a set of these maps uh, for different um, 
different groups uh, with the wonderful students at, at Berkeley. Uh, we went to Bogota, we went to Manila, um, and, uh, and we do this work uh, around the world. Um, currently, also, we're building tools. Um, so we, we're, uh, we're using apps that are, are interactive. And so this is a map where you can click on your infrastructure improvement. That green line is a transit line or a new park or a new bike lane. You can click on that and then you can see in the adjacent community what's the in-migration rate and the out-migration rate for different income groups. And this is, again, something you can do with individual level uh, data if you can get your hands on it. And this, again, we see this as a way of being transparent. So you can see when the transit line went in, this is how many people lived here. And now that it's in, this is how many people that um, live here now. And, and this is who has moved in and this is who has moved out. And people can look for themselves. Another tool we're using uh, is videos. At the School Cities, we do a lot of videos, short explainer videos. I can't tell you how many times I've told a reporter, go watch the video, um, and, and then they, they just summarize it in their articles. So th these are very powerful uh, tools, particularly for dealing with the media. And finally, there's our data insights uh, training. So this is why I was in Fort McMurray last week, is we got a couple million dollars from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to work with cities and community organizations on insights around their communities using sophisticated data sources. So what we're doing in Fort McMurray with Kelly and her colleagues is, is we're trying to identify a story with them. Um, about how they want to maintain their community in the face of climate change. Um, and then we get to geek out because then we get to go find the data that makes the case uh, for them. Um, so uh, really fun work and we hope uh, it will make a difference. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Karen, for your um, uh, keynote. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So, uh, yeah, Celine. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. Um, I would like to, to know how far you can use the concept of transition uh, to, um, to, to conceptualize also this dis displacement and the change of, sp of spatial distributions. So the term of transition, how transition impact and create the, the, the change between different uh, and the adaptation of the system or whatever with different maybe level. I don't know if you know the, 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 the kind of theories of transitions also that are developed. Oh, I, and can you explain a little bit more about the theories of transition? Uh, we've, uh, well, you have some uh, uh, local initiatives or individual mm. initiatives, but a general, uh, uh, let's say, conditions, uh, so which are at the meso or macro level, and they all interact. Mm -hmm. So some uh, avoid the change, others try to change, and it is linked in a way to the panarchy approach also on this uh, uh, complex adaptive uh, systems. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's quite, sounds quite similar to this idea of, of continual, facilitating continual adaptation, but I like this idea of the multiple uh, levels as well. Um, so yeah, I think that it could, we, we may be using the same language to talk, a, a different language to talk about the same thing. Thanks very much. This was um, great to uh, listen to. Um, my favorite in, in the um, number of striking facts that you brought to the audience is this quote from Kelly, that she is tired of being or made to be resilient. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I have this, um, this perception also uh, with respect to the Fox News issue that 
uh, as soon as there is a call for stronger adaptation, stronger climate change and greening policies, the right is mobilizing against that. And uh, if, if you keep in mind this, this quote, I don't want to um, be resilient. I'm tired of ha having to be um, resilient. Would you agree that there is a danger in this technocratic green and resilience policy scheme and particularly its implementation, that this actually, in the way it is, it is being done, that this feeds the Fox machine, mm -hmm. That's, so that yeah. that that they actually see, okay, this is something where people are actually tired of being subject to become green, to become climate adaptive, and everything has to be green, and then the right is making a business a chance out of that uh, very uh, orthodox and very bureaucratic policy scheme. And then um, maybe people who are sensitive of that because they are victim of climate change and, and, and all these issues, they are starting to be lost to the right as a consequence yeah. of this, this. Uh, policy machine. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's exactly right. I think what Fox is promising is uh, that we'll, uh, we'll give you a fantasy, your fantasy world, um, and just, you know, keep watching us and we will keep feeding, you know, giving you the Kool-Aid. Um, and, and, and people want to hear that because they're very, very tired. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're earning very little. They're very barely covering their housing costs, even up in, in the far north of Canada. Um, and uh, in, in they're exhausted. And I think, I, I didn't use a quote that also came from that group, uh, although I was very tempted to. Um, it, it was right before Kelly. Uh, you know, I, I, my question to them was, what do, you see, what do you see this community being in 30 years? What do you want, what do you see for you? What's your vision for your community? And the first answer from that group was, well, all I know is I don't want to see any electric vehicles here. <laughs> so, and then they went off on electric vehicles and Trudeau and the, the target in 2035, they're not selling electric vehicles and I mean, gas fueled vehicles in Canada anymore. All, all new vehicles will be electric in 20, by 2035. And that deadline is in their head and they hate Trudeau and they hate those green policies imposed from above. Um, and so, you know, obviously, I mean, I think that probably the only answer is that we need to have green policies from below um, because in the, you know, they want clean green, you know, they want uh, pleasant places to live. They don't want bad air quality. They don't want the fire, uh, you know, air quality. They, they want their kids to be in healthy environments. They have beautiful parks and they want those parks um, to be the core of the community. So, so we need to make sure that we, we are not just, you know, leaving it to the federal governments and the, and the academic experts, but we're also, you know, empowering those folks to own some of that greenness. Hi, actually it's a really short question. It's more about the use of videos and maps, uh, replacing the ways to, ch to share the information, to empower the, the communities. It's more like about that. Uh, how much can you recommend replace this kind of issues of ways to share the information in maps and videos? Thinking about other kind of urban problems, about violence, about trashing and other kind. It's more about the use of the videos and the maps and how this is efficient to combat this displacing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a mixed bag. I mean, you're, I mean we're, this is an audience of mappers, right? So I, we, we all love maps and well, we wouldn't be in this field. Um, and maps are extremely, um, extremely powerful. Um, um, and seeing yourself on the map and seeing your experience on the map is incredibly legitimizing for people. People don't see themselves in a bar chart. 
Um, I mean, maybe you and I do, but you know, but <laughs> most people see themselves in a place, and and so there's something incredibly powerful about that. At the same time, um, you know, as you know, maps are misused and deceptive and so forth. So we don't want to over rely on them. But but as a starting tool, I think it's very powerful. Um, I have I have one last question. Um, going back to the to, to the uh, initial part of your presentation where you were talking about resilience um, and it would seem then that resilience is not the word and this is not what we actually want to plan for because cities are changing and if we have all this pressure of migration for any kind of reason and if you are right and I think that you, that you are in the sense that all migrants are most migrants are going to go to cities so we have a higher pressure of urbanization and we have a higher pressure on planning where planning is a, a, a actually a tool. It's probably, that's probably true in Canada, it's not true in Mexico. Um, but there's gonna be a very high pressure for, for uh, new urbanization. And so there's no going back to an initial state. Mm -hmm. So it's, the resilience is not the word, it's change and it's growth and it's Which gets back to the transition, right? Yeah, uh -huh. I think that's absolutely right, yeah. And in some ways that maybe that word resilience has held us back because people think about it as bouncing back on that, you know, when, when in that article that I quoted in the engineering literature, resilience is really just bouncing back to the mm -hmm. initial state, right? When we actually need complex adaptive systems and transition. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Karen, for your, your talk. Thank you.